yes. to start off, I guess you, you could say you came into into music professionally at a, at a perfect time with the great folk revival of the early 60s. It must have been an exciting time. It was. It was probably the tail end of the most exciting time, you know, from the turn of the century to to probably the mid-70s was the great zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. So to be a part of the revival is one thing, but, you know, hanging out in Harlem in 1924 wouldn't hurt either. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. You know, yeah. We're lucky that we, we heard and hung out with John Hurd and Booker White and Duke Ellington and all sorts of stuff, but it was at the tail end of things. In that regard, in terms of the folk revival, certainly uh, very few of the revivalists were on the level of the thing they were reviving. Yeah, yeah that's a fair comment. Um, let's talk about your days with the, with, uh, the Jim Quest and uh, Jug Band. Was that uh, primarily the style of music that you, that you were um, first attracted to growing up? No. Um, there were elements in the Jug Band that had to do with the music I grew up with was, was jazz but traditional American jazz. You know, a la Louis Armstrong, Bessie Smith, Sidney Bechet, Big Spiderbeck. And then out of that, I started to hear blues music and country blues. And um, so the jug band sort of incorporated everything when you think about it. Yeah, for sure. And you know what? We just played a couple, three weekends ago uh, at a at a tribute to Eric Von Schmidt in Cambridge. Queskin showed up and Maria was there and I was there and Fritz was there. You know, we all did it. Tremendous. That would have been uh, something special to say. It was fabulous. I just couldn't believe the way Queskin was picking, man. I mean, you know, all these young, hot finger pickers, no one can pick like that guy. It's a whole other thing. You know, it's very unique. So it was wonderful. So, yeah, we did that kind of, you know, I was sort of relegated to blues singing, but I was very responsible in the jug band for jazz arranging, you know, because I came out of that world. Yeah. Would you say you're, you're an active student of various music forms uh, growing up? Did you actively seek out uh, various types of music, in historical blues and folk recordings in particular? Well, I did, yes, but I think I always had it in my mind that I wasn't going to imitate anyone. And to that end, I never, you know, on the clarinet learned exact George Lewis clarinet solos, or I didn't learn exact singing styles, or, you know, or learn Eddie Lang guitar parts, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I consider that a classical approach, which some guys do very well where they'll learn how to pick like Blind Lemon Jefferson and do it for us and we can get to hear something like what it was. Um, and I never have done that. I think it was more like I've, I've buried myself in music my whole life and been influenced in many ways by many, in many areas of music you probably wouldn't suspect. Do you remember feeling at the time when you were part of that, that folk scene of the early 60s that you were taking part in, in a period that would have historical significance in later years? Or was it only in later years I that you really... We, I thought the party was going to go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the world had changed. I didn't know everybody was going to get loaded. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, boy, it's, as, it's worse now than it was in the 50s. Mm. You know? The music is worse... And things are more boring and stupid and difficult, at least in the United States. You know, it's a very uh, um, sort of uh, careful and um, and a uh, very establishment type of world in the United States now. Very difficult, very restricting. So, you know, that that's what we thought we broke up in the 60s, but... Here they go again. Here they go again. <laughs> yeah, and they're better at it this time. Was there a distinct difference in the various folk scenes happening in different parts of the, of the United States at the time? Yeah, there sure was. The Cambridge scene and the Minneapolis, St. Paul scene, I think were sort of the prime places for 
producing people who had their own style and who were also not commercially minded. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, uh, out of Minneapolis, you know, at the time anyway, Bob Dylan, but, you know, John Kerner. And they had a very healthy scene, and that's why when Kerner came to Cambridge, he was felt at home because we didn't care about anything commercial. It was all, we were just playing music every day for years and years. And we would never go down to New York to get a record deal. The, the guys came up there, you know. Mm. Whereas in New York, the second anybody had an idea about folk music, there were 10 people lined up to learn the same thing and try and sell it, you know. So it was very commercial in New York. And the other major scenes in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, were more purist in nature, less individualistic, and in Berkeley, where people would learn the music of other people mm -hmm. more, more the way they did it. I would say Ann Arbor and Berkeley were the major scenes there. There was some scene in L.A. where I now live that was fairly healthy, but I think Cambridge was was the wildest of all of them. I mean, I feel very lucky to have been part of that. You know, the place that produced. John Baez and Eric Von Schmidt and the Jug Band and Taj Mahal and Bonnie Raitt, you know? It's not a bad lineup, is it? No. <laughs> no, and, you know, there's more. Yeah. Bill Keith, you know, Bill Keith reinvented the banjo. And, or, you know, they're, they're just all these great folks that we, you know, we played every day. I mean, it was a wonderful scene. So uh, the whole idea of having a cottage industry kind of thing going on with the singer-songwriters is was very new to me when I came back to music. You know, I, I've i never been that self-promoting, you know. So this whole new world is a, is a whole very different to me. But uh, I'm learning to live in it pretty good. In later years, the albums that you recorded with Maria, did both of you having come from band situations beforehand, did you know exactly the type of records that you wanted to make together from day one? No, I never worked that way. I'm not working that way right now. I uh, I just follow my heart to the next song, and then somebody, you know, the thread of all these things is me mm -hmm. and my approach. And that's why, if I were to be a classical musician and I'd render things classically or arrangements or uh, not not put my own thing into everything, it would be you'd have to work more conceptually because that thread would be gone. So you have to say, okay, now I'm going to do the music of blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, but I can do the music of anything because I'm going to molderize it. You know, I'm going to change it anyway. So it's all going to sort of come out in this... Well, we'll see. We'll see what the next record sounds like. You know, but... Uh, so I think that it frees me up to just say, leave me alone. And I got this dream here. I wanted to, I've always wanted to do this Sabu song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, so there are things on this next album like that too. Now you based yourself in, in Woodstock for a while there in later years and, and for outsiders like myself, we have this mental picture of a, a real communal spirit there amongst the musicians. Was it like that? No, huh? not at all. It was much more rock starish much less when I came in there from Cambridge it was much different than the way we lived in Cambridge we were very communal in Cambridge and very you know it was always dinner over so and so's and playing music and when I got to uh, Woodstock everybody was into who, how you know what their new car was like <laughs> so no that's a bunch of horse shit I threw most of the parties and a lot of those guys were just you know sneaking off you know, with their drugs, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So there wasn't much romanticism at all That's about a, Woodstock. The real myth. However, there was a lot of talent there, yeah. and I'm glad I ran into Paul Butterfield, you know. Uh, Paul had lived up in Cambridge for a while, loved, loved it up there, but he, you know, that scene that started out of me and Paul and, and uh, Amos Garrett and the bar scene, and just, you know, we were the party animals. But it um, turned into a pretty damn good band. Hey, you look back on those times now with Butterfield's Better Days. What, what kind of band leader was Paul? What band leader? What kind of band leader was he? Was he uh, a tough taskmaster? Uh, no. 
But he, you know, uh, it didn't matter. He was a tough taskmaster when he played. In other words, he never missed. He was a he was a goddamn genius. Yeah. I mean, he just never missed. I've heard tapes of him at a, in like 1963 over at a friend of mine's house where he just was playing. And he wasn't, I mean, nothing, he wasn't missing anything. It was just totally perfect. It was Paul Butterfield, boom, right out of the blocks. You know, some of those guys are that way. I've, I think I've had sort of a slow, slow process. But some of these guys are have it right off the bat, and he was one of those guys. So when he hit the stage, he was so much all business that if you weren't all business, you, you weren't even going to keep up, you know? And we were all, you know, pretty hot players, and... You know, it was, a, it was a pretty all-star situation. Unfortunately, it was a, it was a short-lived situation too. Do you think that the band may have still had its best work ahead of it had it, had it gone on? Well, no, because of drugs and alcohol, huh. and that's why I got out. Not that it stopped me, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was a way to sort of save myself, and eventually it did. Yeah. But uh, and you know, how long do you think the Love and Spoonful was together? It was only about three years, wasn't it? Two and a half. Two and a half, yeah. Yeah. So it's amazing. Some, you know, it didn't have that, there weren't that many original songs from Better Days, so it didn't have quite the impact that it could have, but anyone who heard that band live, you know, it was pretty scary. Now, you stepped away from, from recording and performing for a while, involved yourself in, in production and uh, some soundtrack work. Is there anything you learned from, from that type of work that has changed your approach to your recording and performing today? Oh, absolutely, man. I mean, I develop my craft. So sometimes I will be doing something in a very loose fashion, and then all of a sudden there's a construction within it that is very intricate. You know, um, the Believe I'll Go Back Home on the album, that tune I wrote on that last album. Do you have that? Uh, yeah, it's on the way. <laughs> oh. It's on the way. Oh, well, that's too bad, because that would be fun to talk about. Yeah, well, I'm actually expecting it in the mail today, so I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, great. Would that be added to this uh, interview in any way? Absolutely, yeah. Great. Sure. Because I think I think what will happen is you'll be pissed and you'll want to talk to me again. <laughs> well, we can I think a lot of things came together. I mean, that was 17 years without an album, and then boom, there's an album. You know? Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of shit on there. I mean, it goes from a very simple to very complex. And uh, we, there's a lot to talk about. So, um, so I guess you know, explaining to you by example can't be done yet. But I, you know, I did craft a lot when you get into this film stuff, or even the crappy jingle stuff I did, uh, commercial work. You have to get so much done in such little time. And, yeah. And you're not hiring the same type of player that you would would normally get funky with <laughs> but you, but you are hiring people who are trained killers at their instruments and you're writing some you know you know they can do it and you you know it's a it, so it's really it has helped me in terms of charting I now do performances with chamber works that I write and uh, for American music and some of my own so I write for bassoon French horn clarinet fiddle and uh, five string bass and and so all those charts are all written for everyone and you know so you learn how to talk to these folks and communicate I love it I love crafting things and then I love throwing it all out you know and just trying to summon up the muse of the the folk muse you know how great an advantage was it to you as a producer to have been a recording artist yourself oh it's it's absolutely invaluable. Yeah. I mean, no, you know, it's nothing you can take for granted that you were given the opportunity. Well, first of all, the talent, you know, it's not a, you know, it's a wonderful thing to have been given. And then the opportunity, especially in those days, to be on Warner Brothers and just basically have the bankroll to do anything you feel like, you know, and to have you know experiences with string sections and all sorts of different types of musicians and you know there's a learning process that was very expensive <laughs> <laughs> and which i could not have afforded when i'm writing for uh you know american airlines 
you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, School of Hard Knocks. Are there any moves afoot to have some of your, your past albums, that, which unfortunately are out of print now, reissued on CD? There's one going to come out on uh, Rounder right. next spring of the best of me that they got from Flying Fish. But that was my later stuff, even after uh, Paul Butterfield, where I was sort of crashing and burning. And it's not my best stuff. The The stuff that I wish would come out is the Warner Brothers stuff, you know. Mm. Stuff I did with Maria and then my own Having a Wonderful Time album. Oh, yeah. Which just, you know, has some... So I'm going to probably just make a CD myself and sell it from gigs and, and um, you know, the ultimate pirate. <laughs> you know, I mean, what you know, if they'd put it out, who, you know, I wouldn't do it. But yeah. The better Butterfield stuff's out. Oh, for sure. Days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even though I don't have a copy in front of me, let's talk about your most recent solo album. It, it must have been a, a. Did you have a strong yearning to, to get it back into the studio again and record? After so long, I you did. must have. Yeah. What happened is I had a yearning to go back to my old life. I had drifted into the consulting and computer business and I had developed software. I had designed software for the steel processing industry for the big three automakers for in Detroit. And I had found that my composition abilities carried over into design and so I made some money you know and did that but I just got soul sick you know it was like uh, I was dealing with people who were lying and cheating and thieving you know and I really longed to just take a shot and uh, follow my heart and go back to being a a low rent musician man and I've never been happier since I've been back for the last couple of years here I mean it's just heaven I mean just give me 50 or 100 people in a little pub and man I'm in I'm in heaven <laughs> nice to I hear. just love it one of the players on the album and someone that you've collaborated with many times in the past is Amos Garrett who also I spoke to recently uh, it must be a fantastic uh, relationship between the two of you you well, you know, we came up through that same jazz thing that we started this beginning of this interview. A lot of the same music I was listening to, Amos was listening to, especially in the, the Midwestern 20s white jazz, the big Spiderbeck world. Um, and, you know, Pee Wee Russell and Jack Teagarden and, you know, all these wonderful players. Amos knew all about that stuff, too. And, and if if you listen to his guitar playing on his early stuff on Georgia and things like that where he's playing slowly enough to sort of really phrase in that typically Amos way you you would be surprised how many how much of it is influenced by the trombone playing of Jack Teagarden and other trombonists mm -hmm. Amos played trombone for nine years or something that's right yeah. so his phrasing and some of his the way he approaches things is very early you know jazz from that wonderful zeitgeist we talked about you know and yeah so we we hit it off just boom mm -hmm. you know, I don't see him very often because he lives in Canada and well he did rave about the album to me well I, you know there's some good I got, you know, I, I don't want to rave about it because I'm about to, I'm doing my new one right now, but <laughs> that other one had something happen. Now your daughter appeared on the record as well, and, and she's recorded in her own right. How is her career coming along? Oh, she's mostly a commercial singer. She'll do ads and stuff, or she'll, you know, go out on the road with John Cale or something. She's, she's sort of a, she's less got her own career than she is able to sort of, do various things she's very talented and I have a younger daughter than she who's now graduating from music school at the Berkeley School of Music in Boston and uh, she may carve out a little career and she's on this album oh tremendous the one I'm doing yeah now you recorded the album before any label actually had uh, rights over it is that right that's one of the things that made it as good as it is. It must have given you... I had that money from Detroit, right? Uh-huh. So I could just peck away at it little by little. 
I, I wasn't even thinking of a record label at first. I just wanted to get it all out there, you know. So if I had a bad session, I'd say, well, fuck it, I'll do it later, and I'd redo it. You know, and it's, it has to do with having the money to spend, and I did. Must have been a great sense of freedom without that record company hang, hanging yeah. over you, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I ha you know, high tone doesn't hang over you, but there's only so much budget. Yeah. Um, and, you know... So, but, um, no, they've been great. Uh, they're music people, you know, and they got you know, Dave Alvin and Chris Smith are on that label, and they're into just good feeling stuff, you know. So I like them for that. So the next next album will be with High Tone as well? Yes. Oh, tremendous. And um, recording with some folks that I haven't recorded with before, like David Lindley is, and I do one thing together, which is pretty cool, and... Uh, some of that woodwind stuff I told you about is yeah. on this, and I've been recording with uh, the McArigal sisters, and I did one tune together. Yeah. I love them; they're my dream boats. <laughs> <laughs> I have a special place in my heart for them. They're just unique. They are, aren't they? Oh God! So we were just in the studio about two or three weeks ago, and just I had a ball. Now, another project you were involved in recently was uh, John Sebastian's J Band, which, which must have brought back great memories of the old Jug Band days for you. Yeah, it does. Uh, it isn't as arranged as the Jug Band was, uh, which is part of my joy of doing this. It's coming up with, like, for instance, Fritz is on my new album, mm -hmm. and he's playing the Jug on a tune called At the Christmas Ball that my daughter sings, and and there's the Jug plunking along but there's also a bowed bass and Richard Green is on fiddle and it's arranged and I'm playing clarinet and there are little tricky things going on and Roswell Rudd you ever heard of him? Um, not the okay. avant-garde trombonist okay yeah <laughs> he's on it but what I'm getting at is it's more like the way the jug band would have done it whereas if Sebastian's is a looser kind of uh more rural, in a sense, approach to things. Mm -hmm. so, man, here are the chords, let's go. Yeah. And, which is fun. I mean, you know, he's a great guy, and actually those guys are out playing gigs right now. I don't play with them very often. Uh, you know. That was more so for recording purposes. Yeah, well, I'll show up for gigs that are special or that don't conflict with my own career. In other words, if they're going to do a folk festival... I don't do it because I can do the folk festival myself. Yeah, yeah. So, except in Australia, it seems. I don't know. We're having a little trouble with that. <laughs> um, I appreciate, by the way, your uh, suggestions of that other fella, and I let my manager know. Oh, good. Uh, and just before we wind up, Jeff, the, the new album, what, what stage is it at now, and uh, what, look, what sort of release date are we looking at there? It releases on uh, October 3rd. Oh, okay. It has a wonderful cover by this, in our country anyway, a very famous New York artist named Larry Rivers. One of the, he's the last New York school, you know, from the 40s and 50s artist uh, who's already done the cover. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we'll see. I'm about two-thirds of the way through. Tremendous. I will look forward to that. Okay, yeah, Jeff. To it. Thanks for your yeah, time. John. Really appreciate it. Uh, Hope you enjoy the album. Email me when you get it and let I me will. know what you think. And, we'll and uh, I might fire off another question or two about how to get down there. We may have already lost our opportunity, uh, Port Ferry wise, and everything with this switch in the uh, booking ag agent and all that. But uh, there are other years coming. Oh, look, it's, um, it's not the only festival down here either. <laughs> Right, it seemed like the linchpin of any tour, though. It does, yeah. A lot of people use it as uh, right. basically the reason to get over here and then work the tour from that, yeah. Yeah, and I have Japan set up as well whenever the Australian thing happens. So, oh, okay. Um, that would be nice. I think I could even uh, do something in New Zealand. So uh, I'd love to meet you and get down there, and maybe that'll happen in the next couple of years. That'd be great. We'll get you in the studio and get you to bring your guitar along. and uh, Nothing I'd rather do. Yeah, it'd be great. That's why I gave up making all that money <laughs> in Detroit so no I love doing that terrific thanks a lot Jeff what it's all about okay, okay John. we'll keep our fingers crossed we see you here next year alright all the best bye bye